Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I chair the committee responsible for these broadcasts. Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest, Sarah Cliff. Sarah is an investigative journalist for healthcare at the New York Times. Previously, she was a policy correspondent for Vox.com, and before that, a reporter for the Washington Post. In addition to writing articles, giving talks, and contributing to blogs, Sarah is a frequent podcast guest and occasional podcast host. She appears on radio and TV a good deal, for instance, nine times on Fresh Air with Barry Gross. Sometimes she is joined by her New York Times colleague as Recline, for instance, when they interviewed Barack Obama about the Affordable Care Act in 2017. Sarah graduated from Washington University in St. Louis. She lives in Washington, DC with her husband and son. And most important to us, her grandfather <laughs> is a resident of Laguna Woods and a member of Concerned Citizens. We thank him for prompting us to invite her. Welcome, Sarah Cliff. Thank you so much for having me. To begin, please tell our audience a little about your career. How did you get into investigative reporting in general and healthcare reporting in particular? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, I started off as a student journalist when I was in university at Washington University, and um, it was an extracurricular I really enjoyed. And then it just seemed like the greatest thing in the world um, that I could go do this thing I'd been doing for free, could actually do it as a job. Um, I found that really exciting and went for it. Um, my father was a journalist for a while. He went to journalism school, so I might have at first, I thought it was the least cool thing in the world to do whatever your uh, parents do, <laughs> but I eventually got over that because I realized um, I think the thing I love about journalism is just the opportunity to talk to so many interesting people who just have really worthwhile, important stories to be told and that I get to ask them about it. I get to ask all sorts of probing questions that normally would be quite socially awkward, and then I get to write about it. So it just feels like a great privilege um, to be able to do that professionally. And you know, I like healthcare specifically. It was kind of a beat I was assigned to about 10 years ago at this point when I was really starting off in my journalism career. And I think the thing I love about healthcare is just it's something that affects all of us. Um, you know, none of us get to decide whether we want to be part of the healthcare system or not. Um, at some point we're all going to need to go to the doctor, to the hospital. We're all going to need medical care. And it's it is a such a human topic to cover it's you know really literally life or death consequences and but it also is um like a really nerdy policy topic to cover that a lot of the decisions being made here in washington trickle down to the experiences everyone's having across the country so i just find it's yeah i've been covering it for 10 years at this point and i've never been bored with it or wanted to cover something else i just think it's like an endlessly fascinating um topic to be diving into Right. And yes, and 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 it'll move, it'll always have new dynamics that, that you know you can explore. That that's for sure. It's not mm -hmm. it's not static in any way. Mm -hmm. So um before we get into some of the problems that you've uncovered in our healthcare system, um, I think our viewers would really be interested in learning how you get your information. How how do you get the human stories or or even the bureaucratic experiences mm -hmm. that that you describe so vividly in your stories? Yeah, a lot. You know, it comes from all sorts of places. Some of it is just people reaching out to me um, because I've been covering healthcare for a while, kind of with a focus on medical billing. 
Um, I've had some people proactively reach out to me saying, you know, I had this thing that happened to me and I feel like people should know about it. Um, so it's certainly some of that. It's also me soliciting certain kinds of stories. When I was at Vox a few years ago, I ran a project where we asked people to send us their emergency room bills and have been running a similar project at the New York Times um, asking people to send us their bills for coronavirus testing and treatment. So in that case, we knew there was a topic we wanted to cover. We knew that our readers had good stories to share. So we kind of reached out to them proactively. Um, Could you explain you know, other... a little more? How do, how do you reach out to them? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yes. Yeah, what so does that mean? How, how do you get it, them to, can I write you? Yes, yes, of course you can. <laughs> um, and anyone can listen and can write too. Um, so what we did in both of those cases, you know, just use the coronavirus testing and treatment one um, as an example, is we put up a story on our website at the New York Times where we basically said, we're interested in understanding the experience, the billing experience patients are having with coronavirus. We want to know about testing. We want to know about treatment. If you have been billed for one of those things, fill out this form. You know, It had information like your name, your age, um, where you lived, a place to write a short description of what happened. If you wanted, you could attach a copy of the bill, but you didn't have to. And um, if you chose to you know, put your information in there and click submit, then it would go into essentially a database I have on my end where I can see all these submissions that people have sent to us. Um, and the folks you know, at the Times helped share it on social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. I've shared it on my own platforms. Um, so one of the hardest things is actually, you know, getting it in front of the right people and getting it in front of a lot of people. Um, but one of the benefits of working at a large news organization is kind of having that reach to reach a wide number of people who might be interested in sharing those kind of stories. Okay, I'm just still a little curious. So now at the <laughs> other end, especially you know, now that you're quite well established, you have a team of folks that process these. What, 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 what? No. no, it's what? just me. <laughs> you read them. Well, how many I read them all. How but I think it's actually, <laughs> I mean, I think it's actually important to read them all because that's how you kind of spot patterns and you see things that are out of the ordinary. For example, I was able to use all these submissions about coronavirus testing. I noticed there was one hospital in New York City, Lenox Hill Hospital, that was routinely charging three thousand dollars per coronavirus test. And I don't think I would have connected the pieces if I wasn't the one literally going through each of them and saying, hey, that's, you know, the first time it shows up, you think maybe something weird. Second time, odd coincidence. By the third time you see it, you're like, oh, something's going on there. Um, so it is, you know, it is not the most glamorous thing to be doing, but I find it actually yields really good results going through all of the um, submissions myself. Um, so how that's many, how, I'm able to spot them. how many might you get uh, for one project? Hundreds? Um, yes, on hundreds. this one, we have about 800 right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so wow. usually, when, yeah, when the project launches, we get a big wave and then they sort of trickle in a little bit slower. So I just try and take, you know, a few hours each week to read through whatever's come in and just stay on top of the project. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm glad I got you to give us that number. So now we really, <laughs> we really do have a feeling of, of what that experience uh, is like. Wow, I'm really impressed. Okay. All right. So that so uh, when you choose to work on something, then you you get a lot of data. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit. I think you kind of did this uh, approach. Let's talk a little bit about the projects you did on surprise medical bills. Could could you tell our viewers what are surprise medical bills and uh, how did you uh, get them and what did you learn about them? Yeah, yeah, so surprise, I think there are all sorts of medical bills that people find surprising, but uh, this particular issue of surprise medical bills, it generally um, re refers to cases where you go to a hospital or a doctor that was in network and unexpectedly, totally unbeknownst to you, some an out of network doctor was involved in your care. The kind of most common example of this is um, someone goes to the emergency room at an in-network hospital, you know, they check their insurance card, they think it's fine, but it turns out the doctor who is staffing that emergency room doesn't actually work for the hospital, and that doctor is not in network with the patient's insurance. Um, that means there's basically no guardrails on what the patient can be billed. Um, you know, there have been cases that I've reported on, that others have reported on of, you know, cases of surprise bills upwards of $100,000. 
And it's really the um, patient is stuck in the middle of a billing dispute between the insurance and the doctor. The doctor thinks they should be able to bill a higher amount. The insurance doesn't want to pay them that amount and they don't have any sort of contract. So, you know, there's kind of no protections there for the patient who has gone to the emergency room. Um, and it's just one of the most, um, I think, one of the most exasperating experiences in American healthcare because the patient often really is no way to know what's happening until a really large bill turns up in their mailbox. You know, I think of one patient I wrote about, um, a guy in Texas who was attacked one night out on the street. He was left unconscious. An ambulance picks him up and, um, you know, thank goodness it takes him to an in-network hospital, but he finds out there he needs emergency jaw surgery. And all this happens while he's uh, unconscious. And it turns out the a surgeon who operated on him was not in network with his insurance and he ends up with an $8,000 bill. And there's really no place the patient could have made a better decision. There's nothing he could have done to avoid that kind of charge. Um, and, you know, I got interested, I, I had heard a few instances of it. I knew it was really common in emergency room billing. But the thing that was really hard to know without, you know, seeing patient bills was like, what, what did this actually mean for patients? What were the size of these bills? There were some academic studies on this, but there wasn't as much, you know, reporting on the actual patient experience. So that got me interested in collecting a lot of these bills. And that was you know, a project I did about four years ago at Vox now. Um, and the good news is policy change is coming. Um, Congress passed a ban on surprise medical bills um, that goes into effect in January 2022. So starting in two and a half months from now, um, if you go to a hospital and that doctor is not in network, they can't send you a bill anymore. Um, they will have to sort it out with your insurance company and they are not allowed to put the patient in the middle of it. So, um, so that is kind of one... <laughs> One positive change in our healthcare system, I think. That and that's because of you? Were that, did you Not just myself, my reporting, the reporting of others, um, Congress, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people in Congress who took on this issue. It was a long, hard fought battle for an issue that was actually quite bipartisan. Republicans and Democrats agreed these bills were outrageous, they should change. It still took about a year and a half, two years from <laughs> legislation being introduced to passing and another year until it's being implemented. Um, but yeah, it feels nice to have played a, you know, a role in kind of helping get, make the healthcare system a little bit more consumer friendly. Right. No, that's, that's, that's wonderful. That's terrific. Okay. Uh, another topic, uh, that you, the more recent one, mm -hmm. the one that actually your grandfather brought to my attention or to concern citizens' attention is this phenomenon where, uh, you find that within a single hospital, uh, they're charging, uh, different amounts for the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I gather, correct me if I'm wrong, this information comes as a result of a new law. So we didn't know this before, but, uh, that forces hospitals and insurance insurers to reveal their prices, not uh, from what you say, not that everyone is actually complying, mm -hmm. but to the extent that they do comply, uh, this is a, a context in which not the patient, but actually the institution has to reveal some information. Um, and so what you find, and the, the example, that this was pushed on the front page of the New York Times mm -hmm. because it's so striking, um, is that a given hospital uh, could charge an insurance company $1,000 for an MRI and then charge another insurance company five thousand dollars and then what was perhaps even more surprising was occasionally people who had no insurance at all uh, might only pay five hundred dollars uh, mm -hmm. all for the very same mri so uh could you please tell us a little bit about the processes behind these wild variations yeah so this like you said this is all the result of a new regulation that went into effect at the start of this year these are actually rules that were written by the trump administration that required hospitals to disclose their negotiated prices prices with insurers they were very hard aggressively fought by the hospital industry which you know sued and lost multiple times to try and block these rules from going into effect um so were written by the trump administration put into effect by the biden administration and um, so at the beginning of the year, there was this requirement that hospitals have to post whatever prices they've negotiated with insurance companies, which is a major, major deal in the healthcare space because for decades, hospitals and insurance companies have done everything they can to keep those prices secret. Um, it's 
um, and, you know, often to the detriment of consumers who, when they're shopping for health insurance, you know, you can see your premium, you can see your deductible, you can't see if your insurer is getting you good deals or not. That information, you know, I talked to some employers who said they've asked for that information, employers who buy coverage for their workers, and we're told, oh, that's under um, a gag clause. You know, the insurance companies would say, we can't share that information with you. We signed a contract with the hospital saying we don't release that. And if you just think about how wild that, I mean, that's like going to a restaurant where they tell you, oh, we don't tell you the prices beforehand. We'll just bill you whatever, you know, we want to bill you for dinner. And some people get billed $5 for a hamburger and some people get billed 50 and you have no idea which person you are until after you eat the hamburger. Um, it's just such a different market than any other good we purchase. Um, so compliance has not been great. I think we have about half or so of American hospitals complying at this point. The fines are pretty minimal. Um, you know, I think for a hospital that doesn't comply, the total fine this year will be about $100,000, which if you think of the revenue hospitals bring in for a lot of particularly large hospital systems, that's just a teeny tiny drop in the bucket. Um, but the Biden administration is talking about increasing those penalties next year. So I worked with a few of my colleagues at the Times to gather up these data sets, which are quite large um, and not well organized. And But luckily we had some resources to kind of clean them up and standardize them. And what we see is exactly what you're describing, Suzanne, just huge variation between what different health insurance companies, and these are major health insurance companies. These aren't kind of small one-off ones, but you know things like Aetna, Cigna, United, are playing really, really different rates for really basic services. You know, we focused our work on things that shouldn't vary that much from a hospital to another, you know, in terms of quality, things like an MRI, or um, we did a knee replacement is a pretty common surgery. Um, what else did we look at? Um, CAT scans are another one. Again, these are things where the patient experience, regardless of what insurance you have, should be pretty similar if you're getting a CAT scan or you're getting an MRI. And, you know, I think what it sometimes reflects is the market share of the insurance company. Uh, you know, the ones that are larger can sometimes negotiate better prices with the hospital. But sometimes, you know, there's all these hidden patterns we just weren't aware of before. You know, we saw cases where even within the same hospital, within the same insurer, the insurance company would be selling six different plans and each of the six different plans would have their own price. And the HMO would be five times less than the PPO, but again, none of this is in the brochures patients are getting. Um, so I think there's still a lot more work left to be done with that data. The Wall Street Journal has also done some really nice reporting on it. Um, but I think it's really just showing us a lot of these patterns that you know, up until now were completely hidden from us. Um, and that it really is consequential, you know, which insurance company you choose in terms of what prices you're going to pay at your local hospital. Okay, well, let, let, let's look at this a, a little bit more detail. So um, first of all, now we know about this. And the first question that comes to my mind is, have the insurance companies known about it? Uh, obviously, if they have different plans for different customers within one mm -hmm. firm, they knew about it. But uh, does, does Blue Cross know that, uh, I don't know, Aetna is paying more mm -hmm. or less? Do they talk or surely? And then there's this business of stealing one another's employees mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So <laughs> I'm just wondering, I mean, what about communication? Do you have a sense of whether they know this? Yeah, so I don't think the other insurers know what their competitors are paying. And I think the hospitals use that to their advantage in negotiations. I think if everyone knew you know, United is getting this great deal on MRIs, is paying $300 for MRIs, they would start demanding that too. Uh -huh. um, and then for the insurers, it's a, not a very competitive market. You know, in most places, you only have a choice of like two or three plans. Um, and the way, you know, one person I talked to described it to me is as long as your prices aren't totally crazy at every hospital, you can kind of get by passing this on as, you know, premium increases to consumers. Because at the end of the day, you know, insurance companies are, are essentially a pass-through entity. You know, they're taking, they're pooling the money of their members to pay for healthcare. And if the prices go up, you know, insurance contracts tend to be pretty sticky. People don't like switching insurance because it means switching their network. They can kind of just take those larger prices, pass them on as premium increases, pass them on as larger deductibles. And, you know, the kind of status quo keeps going. So I think what you have in this case is you have hospitals with very strong incentives to charge high prices because you know, the higher prices they 
charge, the more revenue they can bring in. And hospital or insurance companies with very weak incentives to negotiate good prices. Um, I also think one other dynamic to think about is the hospitals, I think at the end of the day, have more leverage than the insurance companies. They're actually controlling the good that people, you know, really can't say no to. So at the end of the day, you think you know, insure, a hospital has a lot of leverage, especially if they're like a big brand name hospital or like the, you know, you think of your big hospital in town. If the insurance company says, no, we won't pay the price you want us to, um, they might lose their customers because people want to go to the big hospital in town. And um, so I think that's one other dynamic that's playing out there too, is really the strong market power that hospitals have in these negotiations. So, so it's absurd for me to think about, well, uh, you know, insurance companies ought to get together uh, and collude and, and communicate and bargain. No. <laughs> well, I think that's the, that's the theory behind Medicare for all or um, some kind of public regulation of rates. I don't think they have a strong incentive to get together and bargain. I think the system works decently well from the insurer perspective, um, but obviously from the patient perspective, if you're the one you know, paying the five times higher prices, you don't feel like it's working quite as well for you. I see. So essentially what you're saying is the insurance companies uh, will be able to, 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 to get uh, these, these fees from you one way or the mm -hmm. other. So why the heck should they try to lower them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think one of the things we learned, we talked to a lot of like people who work in the insurance industry, people who buy insurance, and they said, you know, these contracts tend to be pretty sticky. Once a big employer yeah. decides to go with your insurance company, um, it's really, it, 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 the workers are going to get so frustrated if you switch insurance and like no one likes having to find new doctors and navigate new networks. Awesome. So it, there just isn't a super strong incentive to negotiate great prices because your customers are going to be pretty loyal regardless of whether you do that or not. Got it, got it. Okay, one last question about this, and I don't know how many other people feel this way, but I'm just amazed that that hospitals are, are the culprit here. Uh, <laughs> my, old, my, my fantasy was, you know, I have these out, my physician is my friend, mm -hmm. and my, my hospital is a nonprofit, and what it wants to do is give me the best possible service so it can put little signs all over the place telling us about how highly rated mm -hmm. it was. Um, but now it seems like the way you're describing it, that hospitals are actually profit maximizers. So what's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think we have made the decision in the United States, which is, you know, a decision that I don't think any other developed country has made to not regulate our healthcare prices. You know, most other countries think of healthcare as like a similar to a utility. It's something that's so important, like water, electricity, that the government has to step in and set prices. You know, we have not done that. And I think, you know, hospitals are responding to the incentives in the market and the incentives in the market say you can earn more money by charging higher prices and by doing more procedures. And, you know, when I think of it from the hospital perspective, it, it, it's a perfectly rational response to the incentives they are being given um, and how to best operate their business. You know, at the end of the day, many for-profit hospitals are publicly traded companies and they're, you know, responsible to shareholders for generating revenues. Um, and even, you know, nonprofit hospitals, I would say, are not... Uh, are certainly not precluded from engaging in, you know, some pretty aggressive debt collection practices, some pretty aggressive pricing strategies. Um, you know, you can see these nonprofits um, just reporting, you know, really high revenue on their tax forms year after year after year. So I think it's both the case, and we, you know, saw this with the coronavirus pandemic, like hospitals provide wonderful life-saving care that I'm sure all of us have benefited from at one point or another, but they are also businesses and they're businesses that run like any other business you might think of and you know often you know are just as responsible to their shareholders as they are to their patients for getting them better yeah. um, but I think I also had this revelation as a healthcare reporter you know getting into it is that a lot of the reason our healthcare system is so expensive it comes down to the people who are providing the care you know our doctors tend to be paid higher higher salaries than doctors in other countries. Our hospitals, you know, tend to charge higher prices than hospitals in other countries. Um, it, it really comes down to not the volume of care 
we consume, we actually go to the doctor less than people in European countries. It's just these really high prices. And at the end of the day, those prices are being decided by drug makers, doctors, hospitals, all these people who provide care. Okay, well, maybe this would be a good uh, time to move into that to that issue, right? Because we agreed that uh, we would like to talk a little bit about the U.S. healthcare system in comparison uh, to other countries. So, you know, the U.S. has a mixture of public and private care. It has it has Medicaid for the very poor, and it has uh, Medi Medicare for the old people, and it has a VA, the Veterans Administration, for former military personnel. Uh, and then it has private insurance and no insurance for worrisome numbers of people. So how do other countries do it? And uh, particularly other countries that are uh, relatively wealthy and democratic, they have better systems than us because. Yeah, so they, I think one thing that's really interesting is there's a huge range of ways help other countries do it. What those, I think what the, all those other policy approaches have in common is they kind of start with two principles. One is that everybody should be covered with health insurance, that there should not be people who are uninsured. And two, that the prices need to be regulated, that the government has to step in and say, you know, this is the appropriate price for an MRI, an aspirin, delivering a baby, you know, every sort of service we go to the healthcare system for. So they all start from that same kind of core. Um, but then you see huge variation in where they take that idea. You see some, you know, I think of the United Kingdom, for example, that, um, you know, do as much as they can through public services. So in um, the United Kingdom, they have the National Health Service, which both with basically employs most of the doctors and owns most of the hospitals that people in the UK are going to see. So those are public entities run by the government, um, that's really different from the Canadian healthcare system where the government provides health insurance, but the hospitals and doctors are all privately run. Um, so the government provides health insurance to Canadians. Um, it sets what prices those doctors can charge, but the hospitals by and large are private entities as are the doctor's offices. And then you see, you know, uh, even other countries have gone with another approach of just really tightly regulated private insurance markets. So I think it, a good example of this is Germany where they have hundreds of what they call sickness funds, which are essentially health insurers. And just like in our market, you know, you buy health insurance, you pick a plan from private insurer, but those private insurers are being told, you know, what price are, are working with hospitals that are under some kind of price controls. So the insurers, instead of competing on like who can get the best deal, they compete on customer service and efficiency and, you know, kind of serving their customers, but it just tends to be a much more tightly regulated market. Um, so I think it's really interesting that you don't really see one approach. Um, you see a lot of different approaches from a lot of different countries, but they kind of have this underpinning of universal coverage and regulated prices that they all start from. Okay, well, uh, I I just one thought that just comes to my mind because you mentioning about uh, pay and about salaries. I mean, it certainly is quite the case. I, I, again, I'm mystified about the hospitals, but I do understand that doctors' mm -hmm. incomes, and particularly uh, once they're not just primary care doctors, their mm -hmm. incomes are are, ast are astronomical. Uh, so, for example, in Canada, you've just told us uh, taught us that Canada actually is a private system. Um, so, are the healthcare uh, professionals better compensated, do you think, in mm -hmm. this private system uh, than they might be, say, in the UK system where they're government employees? Yeah, that's a good, you know, I don't actually know the answer to that. I think, you know, in general, they're not going to earn as much as they would being a doctor in the United States. Uh, I think being a doctor in the United States is just a pretty high income profession. Like you said, not as much in primary care, but you, when you start looking at specialties like anesthesiology, um, emergency medicine, orthopedics, you see, you know, often the people who are in the top 1% of earners are people who, you know, work as doctors. So I don't, you know, I, I, I don't think I have the right data to answer the question about, you know, public or private doctors in other countries, but I think they've just made a decision that in their countries, doctors are just not going to earn as much money. And that might come with some trade-offs. You might have some people who, you know, make wonderful doctors who decide not to go into medicine because it's not a very lucrative or not as lucrative of a field in their country. And I think those countries are okay with that trade-off because they feel like we've created a system where everyone can afford to go to the doctor. It's okay if we lose some of these high quality people 
And, you know, that's just like one of the many trade-offs you make kind of writing the policies that are going to structure a healthcare system. Okay, well, um, I'm just, I'm going to jump around a little here because I prefer to follow the thread. So one of the uh, concerned citizens who sent in some, we have some members who sent in some questions. So I just want to run there now because I think it fits. Um, is that we, we want to uh, pick your brain a little as to the direction we might go. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, when, when we, during the election, it appeared that all the Democratic candidates were endorsing single payer and uh, we were going to have a streamlined system system and a negotiation with the drug companies and so forth. Um, but uh, now we're, we're living in the real world. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we are all just, we're concerned citizens and we're very politically savvy. We pay a lot of attention, but our crystal balls are not too good. <laughs> wonder, wondering if yours is any better. That oh. is, what what I, might you anticipate the Biden administration uh, might be able to do either with the Affordable Care Act or with the drug prices or anything. Do you have any thoughts at all? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, my crystal ball is also quite hazy at this point. As I think if you ask the Biden administration or as Congress, they also don't have great crystal balls at this point. Um, I think you're right. There generally was an agreement. It's been a pretty remarkable shift within the Democratic Party, really, even over the last 12, 20 years from you know, the Affordable Care Act or some version of that being the most left-wing option to getting to a point where basically every major candidate, every major candidate in the primary has endorsed some version of Medicare for all. Um, but as we get into legislating, it still seems Medicare for all is quite a ways off. Um, and really the debate right now for this package that the Biden administration is working out with Congress, it centers on a few um, you know, key healthcare provisions that stand out to me. And you know, one is making the Affordable Care Act more generous. So you know, for the folks, about 9 million people in the United States get subsidies from the government to buy their own health insurance through the Affordable Care Act marketplaces. Um, so there's a provision to spend money to increase the subsidies for that. There is a provision to add um, dental, hearing, and vision coverage to Medicare, which I think actually a lot of people when they get to Medicare are quite surprised that Medicare currently does not pay for any of those things. And particularly dental can become like a huge, huge need for people who cannot afford, um, as I'm sure anyone who's not that does knows, it can be quite expensive. Um, and if you cannot afford it, you know, those issues can really fester into something pretty serious. Um, you also have a, a effort to, expand Medicaid to a, you know, about 2 million low income people in these states that don't participate in the Affordable Care Act's Medicaid expansion. And then to pay for all of these healthcare priorities because all those things cost money is this um, proposal to negotiate drug prices and essentially allow Medicare to negotiate the prices it pays for consumers. When Medicare's drug benefit was created, it specifically, you know, one of the ways they were actually able to get it to pass and not, um, and you know, overcome lobbying for the farm industry was guarantee that they would not negotiate prices with drug makers. They would take the list price, and that is what Medicare would pay. Um, that obviously leads to some pretty expensive drug prices. And now there's this policy that is part of um, the Biden proposal that would allow Medicare for the first time to negotiate with drug makers. Um, and I'd say if I, you know, if I have any sense from a crystal ball, it seems like the most likely thing to, you know, if Congress is going to settle on one of those priorities, it's probably extending the Affordable Care Act subsidies. They're the least controversial part of what they're working on. There's generally agreement within the Democratic caucus that they want to do this. There's a lot of fighting but between different members of Congress about should they expand Medicare, should they expand Medicaid, which one deserves the funding. And then at the end of the day, a lot of this gets tied up in that drug negotiation provision. That drug negotiation provision is supposed to save the money that would be used to pay for these other healthcare priorities. So it's a, and it's not totally clear if that's going to stay in the legislation or not. Um, there are some members of the House who said they won't support this drug price negotiation, which has kind of been a bit of a white whale for Democrats for a number of years now. For decades, they've been trying to work on this drug negotiation issue. Um, so it's all really, really in flux at this point. It's really hard to know what, if anything, becomes law uh, with so many of these um, 
these priorities in the mix. So I'm sorry, my crystal ball right now. I think everyone's is just a little bit haywire at this point. Right. Well, and, and, and we would have probably been more optimistic, you know, if we were interviewing you six or eight weeks ago. <laughs> it look, look quite, and who knows how it'll look in the future. I do. We do appreciate that. We, we mm -hmm. understand that, that it is, is difficult. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about COVID, which we haven't really touched mm -hmm. on, um, particularly uh, maybe in terms of, of the costs of COVID. Uh, first of all, I mean, you've done a little research on that, mm -hmm. and I guess that's, a, that's another item that varies, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see this really clearly with coronavirus tests, um, mm -hmm. where it, it is a pretty, you know, basic commodity. And Again, the price variation, which is this is so characteristic of the American healthcare system, is just all over the map. You know, you go to public sites that charge zero dollars for um, a coronavirus test, and then there's cases like the one I mentioned earlier of a hospital in New York City charging three thousand dollars for coronavirus tests. And again, because um, you know a lot of this is not public, um, you know that price transparency rule we talked about earlier that only applies to hospitals, that doesn't apply to doctor offices, to urgent care, to any other site of care. It's really, you know, it's quite difficult to know if you're going to the expensive coronavirus test or the cheap coronavirus test unless you, um, until you get a bill afterwards. You know, I reported on one case in Connecticut where a um, city was running a public coronavirus testing site, which seems like it should be a safe place to get tested. It turns out the doctor they had partnered with to run that test was actually billing everyone's insurance about $2,000 per coronavirus test. Um, so even at a public site, um, and then the cities did not really realize what was going on until a lot of people started saying, why are there these crazy claims showing up on my insurance? Um, so it feels like a really nice, my, well, not, I don't know if nice is the right word, but it feels like a very representative microcosm uh -huh. of the healthcare system where you just see this huge price var variation that stems from the fact there's a total wild west and it's really up to the people providing the coronavirus tests um what price they want to uh, put on them so so are uh so do most people who have insurance are are, are tests covered uh mm -hmm. different prices obviously or maybe some deductible yeah. but but standard insurance would tend to cover tests would it so generally, yes, and this is what makes them a little different than the rest of the healthcare system, is that when the pandemic started, there was legislation that passed last spring that said insurance companies cannot apply normal cost sharing to, to most coronavirus tests. Um, so that means no co-payments, no deductibles. Um, if you go to the doctor, if I went to my doctor's office and said, I feel sick, and they think a coronavirus test is appropriate, my insurance company cannot apply you know, apply the $50 copay and the doctor cannot pursue me for the $50 copay. Um, those are the rules. Um, you know, some of my reporting has found they are very often not being followed. And we don't know if it's because sometimes doctors don't know and they're just billing as normal or the visits aren't getting coded right. But even, you know, I had an experience with my um, then two-year-old, now three-year-old son where he was sick. So we took him to urgent care to get a COVID test. And they said it was going to be a fifty dollars copay, and you know I knew from my reporting that that was just illegal. They weren't allowed to charge me that, but I also wasn't going to get in a fight with the person at the front desk because they were just trying to do their job. Um, so you know I I paid it and I dealt with it later and we got it refunded. But um, you kind of think of someone who you know is literally paid to know about this stuff is getting these you know legal charges, then it's really probably happening a lot across the country. Well, now, what about vaccine? Who's paying for that? Yeah, so the so that's another area where the billing rules are actually have actually worked really, really well. Um, I think the government back in, you know, if you think back to the spring of 2020, they wanted to make sure Americans had um, free access to coronavirus tests. And so they wrote this rule saying, okay, you can't apply the cost sharing to it. They wrote even stronger rules uh, around vaccines if a doctor wanted to get vaccines or a pharmacy, they had to sign a contract, you know, with the federal government saying, we are not going to bill anyone for these vaccines. So they actually got a much more ironclad guarantee that people would not have to pay for it. Um, and so far it seems to be working. I've heard very, very few instances of people getting charged for their coronavirus, for their coronavirus vaccines. Um, the government purchased the vaccines and then insurance companies Medicare, Medicaid are reimbursing insurance are reimbursing 
um, providers for um, for administering the vaccine. Um, so there really shouldn't be anyone out there who is paying for one of these. It really is a very government financed operation. Right. Okay, so now let's move to treatment. Supposing someone becomes ill uh, and they uh, go to physician or they, they actually have to be hospitalized. Um, how does the insurance work there? So, I mean, it depends a lot on what type of insurance you have, but generally, you know, and this is, you know, different now that the Affordable Care Act is in place, is the insurance company should have to cover whatever, and if some agreed upon share of the bills. You know, before the Affordable Care Act, it was definitely a much less standard market. If that treatment was for a pre-existing condition, your insurance company could deny that. Um, you could have a lifetime limit where your coverage caps out at $1 million, which sounds like a lot of money until you have a baby in the NICU and then you spend a million dollars very, very quickly. Um, so generally, if you do need treatment, um, you know, there should be coverage provided by your insurance company. But one trend we are seeing is that patients are being asked to pay a larger and larger share of the bill. We've seen deductibles just really take off over the past decade from, you know, pay, most patients not having any deductible to now patients generally have some deductible. And the amount has just been going up and up every year. So, you know, I, I've interviewed a number of people who both have health insurance and, you know, think it's important, but also feel like they can't afford to go to the doctor right now because, um, you know, for example, they have a $6,000 deductible and they feel like, well, what is even the point of going to the doctor? Because I can't afford it. And I'd have to spend so much money for my insurance to kick in. Um, so, but again, it varies a lot from one, one insurer to another and one patient situation to another. Okay, um, then, you know, I'm gonna go here. Then there are some of us who have exceptional treatments <laughs> uh, like our former president. It seems that while there may be a sort of standard treatment for the masses, uh, particularly at least for political leaders, maybe sports mm -hmm. stars too, uh, there are exceptionally high cost interventions. And I, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the defining features of the American healthcare system is your access to care depends on your ability to pay for it. And, you know, in some cases, that means your ability to buy a really good insurance plan. In other cases, that means, you know, you, you don't even need to buy insurance that you have so much money, you can just finance your care and go where you want to go. Um, that's really, and you see, you know, different variations of this. Again, I, I really think it's instructive to look at international countries. That's just the total opposite of Canada, where, you know, there is no way to cut the line. Um, they basically decided, you see other countries, um, Australia, even England, which has like a very heavily government finance system, they let people buy private insurance alongside their public coverage. So in Australia, for example, let's say you want a public, you want a private room at the hospital, or you want faster access to a specialist, you can buy a private insurance plan to get you those things. In Canada, they outlaw the sale of private insurance. They basically say, everybody is in the exact same queue. You're rich, you're poor, you know, we're all gonna wait in line together. Um, and it's, and um, you know, I've interviewed one Canadian doctor at some point who, you know, kind of said, yeah, sometimes the waits are longer here, but we like our healthcare system because everyone waits the exact same amount of time. Um, we have a system that's really different than that, where the time you wait and the care you get um, really depends on how much ability you have to pay for care um, right now. Right. Okay, uh, let me ask you one last question about COVID. Uh, and that is, what do you think um, is going to happen in the long term in terms of the costs for the vaxxed versus mm -hmm. the unvaxxed? Or more, more specifically, uh, on many healthcare issues like whether you smoke or not, people mm -hmm. pay different prices, or you know, if you want to go to a gym, maybe your insurance will pay your monthly fee and mm -hmm. hope that you actually go. <laughs> um, we have a huge difference here. We have, I don't know, 20, 25% of the population that doesn't want to get vaccinated. Pizza. It doesn't want to get Pizza. vaccinated. Okay. We don't want anything. I'm trying to. We, 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 <laughs> no worries. we be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so do the vaccinated have, have to pay for the unvaccinated? That's the question that. 
So the short answer is yes, because um, that's the way we've kind of decided to structure our healthcare systems. When the Democrats wrote the Affordable Care Act, you know, they basically decided it's not okay to have people with health conditions pay more for their care. It's not okay to charge women higher prices because women are much more likely than men to have babies and being admitted to the hospital to have a baby. Um, it's not okay to ask a person with cancer to pay for their cancer care. Um, that was really one of the huge changes of the Affordable Care Act was saying, you can't vary premiums, you can't vary deductibles based on the health condition someone has. Um, as you mentioned, Suzanne, the only thing that insurance companies are allowed to take into, the only health factor they can now take into account is um, smoking status. And that's just on the individual market. Um, if you get insurance at work, um, if you get insurance, if, if, if you get insurance at work, if you're not buying your own coverage, um, your smoking status is not going to matter for your premium. So Democrats really, you know, ratcheted down and philosophically, they felt like this was the right thing to do, that sick people should not have to pay more just because they are sick. Um, you know, if you think back, we've never asked people who get the flu to cover their coverage if they to pay for their hospital stay if they didn't get the flu vaccine. We've kind of made this conscious choice that we're just going to put those costs on all of us who are sharing, you know, the insurance premiums. And it seems like you're going to see some, something similar with COVID, although it's certainly become a new topic that has bubbled up again. You have seen some employers like, um, I believe it's United um, Airlines, for example, is going to have a surcharge on insurance premiums for people who decide not to get vaccinated. Um, I think we're waiting to see if that is actually legal or not. Um, there might be some challenges to that, um, whether you can actually apply that surcharge. But generally, I think you are going to see, you know, COVID will become just like any other condition, you know, that people get hospitalized for. I'd say the one, um, the, the one way that people who, you know, do get COVID will be paying more is for most of the pandemic, insurance companies waived cost sharing for coronavirus hospitalization. So if you were in the hospital with COVID, you didn't have to pay your deductible, you didn't have to pay your co-payments, they were just going to fully cover the cost. Those waivers have really been phasing out over the past few months. So if you go to the hospital with coronavirus, you know you might have to pay that $6,000 deductible. Um, that's been a controversial change with, um, with health economists, with advocates who study this, who say, you know, potentially that is a consequence when people get, decide not get, who decide not to get vaccinated. But there's also, you know, a lot of children who cannot get vaccinated right now, and they're going to face these higher costs. There are people who you are immunocompromised who the vaccine is not um, effective for, and they're going to pay those costs. So it's a pretty, a pretty tricky issue. But um, that is the one way that I think people with coronavirus are soon going to be paying more for their own care is the end of these waivers that insurance companies had earlier in the pandemic. Okay, so so overall, then what the costs for the pandemic, which are doubtless very high, will, will be borne mm -hmm. by all of us. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's the short version. Okay, um, we got about another 10 minutes. Let me, let me uh, try another little different kind of question. Um, you, you know a great deal about these bills. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're wondering about is whether people have any recourse or what, mm -hmm. what should they do? Or I don't know, maybe uh, you could write a, a self-help book. I suppose <laughs> there, are, there are a few out there. Um, but uh, is there... Uh, are there any regulators or, or uh, groups, either state or federal, let's just start mm -hmm. there, that, that a person can appeal to uh, when they're kind of going in circles with outrageous bills? Yeah, so yes and no. Um, I'd say the best regulator is one I didn't know about until I got into this um, coverage is your, your state insurance regulator. So every state has an insurance commissioner um, who oversees the insurance industry. Health insurers are typically under their jurisdiction. And that is really the place to go if um, you feel like your insurance should be covering something and they're not, or they're charging you a fee that shouldn't be applied. Um, that can be a really good resource. Um, I've also seen some patients have success, you know, appealing if they feel like there's some kind of scheme going on or exorbitant pricing, appealing to their state's attorney general, which will sometimes investigate those sorts of issues. Um, this came up earlier in the pandemic. A number of doctors in states all across the country were charging some kind of COVID fee, basically an extra fee for the cleaning that they had to do. And a number of state investigators basically sent out letters to doctors saying, you can't charge this, this breaks your insurance contract and the negotiated prices you have. Um, 
you know, other things you can be doing. And there's actually is a wonderful book that came out on this that I did not write, but a reporter at the web, the um, investigative news outlet ProPublica, Marshall Allen, published a book earlier this year that the name of the book I'm forgetting, but the, the okay. author is definitely Marshall Allen. It's a whole book on, you know, how to deal with outrageous medical bills. Um, you know, things I think about in my own life is looking at what I was billed for, making sure it seems like it lines up with um, what services I actually received. Um, in the case of, you know, I mentioned a few times these $3,000 ER, um, these $3,000 COVID tests at a New York hospital. Um, when I was able to look at a few patient bills, I realized they were billing everyone who got a COVID test for an emergency room visit. And that's why the price was so expensive. And um, they can definitely be a little tricky to decode. A lot of them are, you know, some complex codes. They do not make it easy for you to read, but that might be another thing to be doing. Um, you know, reaching out to the hospital itself is, it can often be a good tactic. I think one of the things I find really frustrating is there isn't, if you feel like you're being charged a too high price by your hospital, there's just not a great person to turn to in that situation. Um, because we don't regulate healthcare costs, there's no regulator to say, yeah, that price is too high. You know, in those cases, it really is, you know, whether the hospital is willing to negotiate with you or not. And you can, you know, try your best to make your case, but you're, a little, it's, it feels like a little bit of the, a, a lot of these I've seen are somewhat David and Goliath battles where it's kind of up to the hospital to decide if they want to lower their prices or not. Right, but um, maybe I'm wrong, but I have gotten mm -hmm. the impression that on occasion that, you know, that if people are very persistent, mm -hmm. it's a question of how much, you know, how much, how much time and money and effort you're willing to devote, you know, to, to arguing, but that, that, that uh, people have, you have reported on people have not yeah. have succeeded. That's true. But I think there's also, I mean, the, the risk you run of doing that, if you decide, you know, I'm not going to pay this bill, I'm just going to keep fighting it is hospitals regularly sue patients over unpaid medical bills. Mm -hmm. um, so they can decide, you know, you haven't paid this for a year. Um, and I wrote a story about this, about nonprofit hospitals that, you know, file thousands of lawsuits against their patients every year. If they're successful in suing you, they can garnish your wages. Um, mm -hmm. There was a case of the University of Virginia that another reporter at Kaiser Health News wrote about was, um, place was repossessing patients' homes um, who did not pay their medical bills. Um, so that is the, you know, oh, yeah. and again, it's really hard to know. Most hospitals don't sue patients, um, but it's hard to know if your hospital is one of the ones that sues patients and is not always the thing you kind of want to like test by experience. So I, I, that's I, why I was I, thinking... That's kind of, yeah. I was thinking the other way. My question was, couldn't you, couldn't the patient sue the hospital for price gouging? You could, but I think, it, again, it's a question of, do you want to spend that money? Would it be cheaper for you to pay the medical bill than to hire the lawyer? And are you running a risk of the hospital suing you for your unpaid debt the longer and longer you fight this? It feels like in a lot of ways, just in these negotiations, the hospitals have a lot of the upper hand. And in many cases, they are not afraid to kind of flex that muscle. Right, right. I, I think the David and Goliath analogy <laughs> does, does pretty well capture, uh, even when you say, you know, going to the state regulator, well, uh, or, or the insurance commissioner, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty high up. I mean, you know, and they, I'm sure that they get many, many more complaints than they, you know, they don't, they don't have, they're going to read 800 of them like you do. <laughs> So yeah. Not, yeah. No, and okay. I find, you know, even in my own reporting, usually when I choose to write about a bill, because I think, you know, there's a merit to a story, often the hospital will drop the bill. But, you know, I'm one reporter writing about maybe a dozen bills a year. And that's obviously not a sustainable system to try and litigate, you know, millions of these bills that are, you know, happening each year. Right. Well, and I think they're going to be afraid of you. I mean, <laughs> I, I would certainly be afraid of you if I were a hospital. <laughs> One last question. It's sort of in, in the same vein, uh, but but has to do with uh, sort of the government end of it. Uh, to what extent, One of, this is from one of our members, is Medicare. Mm -hmm. To what extent is Medicare fraud a problem? Mm -hmm. uh, and this this member, uh, she's a member of Concerned Citizens, had an experience where she got a bill and and she, she's reading her bill carefully mm -hmm. and she finds that she has been billed 
uh, for a procedure for a doctor's visit uh, that she never had. She didn't mm. knew who the doctor was and she's a very conscientious. And so she got on the phone and she tried to deal with this. And, you know, after many efforts, she simply decided <laughs> that no, nobody at the other end gave a darn. And so she let it go as well because she wasn't paying for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the story in terms of, of you know, problems from uh, billing at the, at the service end rather than the patient end? Yeah, no, it certainly exists. And I've heard other, you know, people express the same frustration that they feel like they spotted fraud, they spotted something um, that didn't happen, they tried to report it and just felt like they got nowhere. And at some point, you kind of give up, you know, it's not your job to try and save your <laughs> um, insurance company money. Um, and you've done the best you can. I've heard this from people who have reported that type of stuff to Medicare that have reported it to private insurers. Um, I think, I mean, Medicare definitely has a very active operation looking for fraud and what they're generally doing is looking for kind of unusual patterns of billing, for example, um, where they see one doctor, um, most doctor visits are coded on a one to five severity level. And for some reason, one doctor, every visit is, you know, five level severity, which nets the highest reimbursement. So they're kind of looking at those bigger patterns. And I think that makes sense is they're trying to look for like big outliers and, you know, um, and they're, you know, finding people that way. I don't know how much they use. That's a good question. How much they use individual tips. I think there's just a trade off for Medicare of, you know, what fraud is worth investigating and what is just, you know, not rising to the level of, um, you know, investing their resources in it. Um, and I think they're doing most of their work kind of lurking for these large patterns of inappropriate billing where one doctor just looks really, really different from all the other doctors in their area. Well, oh, that's a great answer. A little okay. disappointing, but it, it really does make sense, particularly since if uh, if they're anything like the IRS, they're they have massively not enough resources to mm -hmm. follow up on problems. So, so identifying uh, you know some fairly large scam is definitely uh, a better use of their time than chasing every single person that complains. So we'll we'll keep that in mind the next time we we see something fishy. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, we've had a wonderful conversation. Uh, we've learned a great deal. Some concerned citizens, thanks, Sarah Cliff, for sharing her expertise on health care with us. She has done a fantastic job mastering a really difficult subject, uh, very complicated, and now it's a little bit clearer to us. Uh, and I want to thank our audience as well for giving us an hour of our of their time to watch our program and to assure them that we will have another wonderful hour of Concerned Citizens Presents sometime soon. So see you next time. And thank you. Thank you.